Uh, I apologize for these interruptions, and uh, I suppose they'll happen every 12 minutes and 12 seconds. For some reason, my my camera feels compelled to uh, to terminate the video function at around that time. Uh, <clears throat> so I'll be presenting this my case piecemeal here. Uh, as I recall, I was referring to the two main periods with which Foucault deals, uh, the classical age and modernity. This is the essential break in history that Foucault um, understands we are still dealing with. Um, indeed, uh, let me go back. Uh, I just recall that he, he speaks of himself as, as writing um, history dealing with the past so as to be able to better understand who we are in the present and I have to say does an absolutely brilliant job of this um, where's all where are all these absolutely's coming from I wonder nah, no matter um, we understand that the classical age as as terminating in the, the last decades of the 18th century, uh, somewhere in the 1790s, occasionally in the 1780s, uh, the 1780s in, in particular, uh, for example, in uh, the history of medicine and the history of madness, uh, the 1790s with the birth of the, uh, of the prison. Let's see here. Um, let me say something very quickly about about Foucault's uh, well, not quickly about Foucault's notion of power. After all, this is by far his most influential theory. It's also, unfortunately, his most misunderstood theory. Um, this is essential. This point is absolutely essential. Foucault's theory of power is not a negative theory. It's a positive theory. He sees power as being a productive force, not a negative force. Uh, this in direct contrast to the classical age when indeed it was a negative force. And I'll use an example from uh, Discipline and Punish uh, to, uh, to exemplify this. Um, Up, into, up until somewhere around the 1790s, power resided with the sovereign. The sovereign was the embodiment of the state, after all. Any offense against the state, anytime one broke the law, it was a direct challenge to the power of the sovereign, to his or her legitimacy, and therefore such offenses were compelled to be dealt with by a representative of the sovereign in the name of the sovereign so as to reestablish the king or queen's um, absolute hold upon power. This was done uh, very often through elaborate public and ritualistic punishments. Indeed, Discipline and Punish opens with one of the more, more harrowing uh, five or six pages that you, you'll ever come across in, in an academic text, uh, namely the execution of the attempted regicide Damien's. He goes, he, he uses the, he uses contemporary newspaper accounts to describe in detail the drawing and quartering of Damien's. Uh, which turned out to be uh, significantly more difficult than than such an exercise ought to be. Uh, the horses, it turned out, could not pull his limbs apart. Uh, the idea there was that that um, the prisoner was was tied, each limb tied to a horse, and his limbs spread 
to the four corners, uh, <clears throat> ending in the decapitation of the accused. Well, <laughs> his executioners went to all sorts of lengths in order to effect, effectuate this, this punishment as it ought to be, uh, to no avail. Um, it is truly a gruesome account. In fact, I recall a classmate of mine uh, making the claim that she actually got physically sick reading this account, and it is indeed gruesome. Um, <clears throat> These public rituals, and if, if I recall, uh, Damien's was, uh, his execution was in, well, I can tell you, ha, I believe it was 1739, although why I would remember that, I have no freaking clue. Ha, and I didn't remember it, it was in 1757, in fact, on the 2nd of March, 1757. Um, these public ritualistic punishments continue for another 40 years or so. And of course, this was and had been the practice ever since the codification of France and the establishment of the monarchy um, in France. In the 1780s or so, the public begins to be somewhat restive at these events. And indeed, there was a constant danger that the public would turn against the executioner, therefore, right in theory, against the power of the king, the representative of the king, um, and do violence to the executioner, him or herself. There was uh, a sort of, there was a ubiquitous sentiment um, in favor of the victim around this time. Uh, and indeed, I, I suppose that we can assume that this is because of precisely how gruesome these rituals were. Um, I mean, e even hangings were very, came to be opportunities for a public that, that was unhappy with um, any number of, 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 the, of issues uh, to uh, express their displeasure against the monarchy by uh, <laughs> turning, turning the executioner's tools against him uh, and executioners would always in this case, be, be males. Um, so, it, indeed, the, the second part of discipline and punish is, is called generalized punishment. Um, and this generalized punishment, again, is established at the, the very end of the 18th century, primarily for two reasons. Uh, the, the one of which I've already spoken of, the danger that the king's power would be defied by some sort of um, rebellious act of the, of, of, uh, the spectators of the punishments. The second reason, or the second factor here, had to do with various groups who began to concentrate on, on issues of humanity, right? Punishment ought to be more humane. Um, moreover, punishment ought not to be about revenge, which is precisely the model of the sovereign. Instead, punishment ought to be about justice, and ultimately about rehabilitation, although, as, as we'll see, the system, the very system which, set up, which is set up to, to rehabilitate ends up instead proliferating, uh, well, what, what comes to be called delinquency instead of criminality. Um, 
Okay. So with, with the advent of modernity, and Foucault dates this with the turn of the 19th century, what he calls a, the disciplinary regime of society uh, is ascendant. Um, <clears throat> discipline is a very different creature from punishment as as, as, as revenge. Um, and this disciplinary model is based very much upon a fundamental transformation, or so Foucault argues, in the very nature of power. Here is an epistemic break, um, which, of course, greatly influences practice, indeed transforms it. Um, <clears throat> again, power it, for Foucault is a productive mechanism in society. It is ubiquitous. I mean, in fact, it is it's absolutely pervasive. Uh, he, he speaks of, of both micro and macro power. He talks of power as a series of, of, of webs that are, are infinitely intertwined and um, <clears throat> transformed. Right? For every power, there's a counter power, um, which leads to a refinement and an elaboration of yet another branch of, of, of power and, and how it's exercised. Um, very specifically, and, and this pertains, or will pertain to, to uh, sociology, um, power for the first time 